All right. Last speaker of the event. That's always great, um, especially coming after Professor Frank. Um, thank you all for, for sticking around. Um, so it's my job, um, sort of by tradition now, to end the conference um, by using all the learning um, that I've seen from all the other speakers, um, which was fun the first time I did it, but now it's a real job because on Wednesday morning when I start, my presentation deck is empty. And then, you know, the next day in the afternoon, um, I have to have a presentation ready that I haven't practiced, that I just whipped together, you know, five minutes before I walk on stage. Um, so it's always, it's always entertaining, that's for sure. Um, so my name is William Bucker. I'm with Destination Think. I'm actually based in Vancouver, um, but I am Dutch. Um, so it's really special for me to, um, to be in Amsterdam and, uh, and present here. I'm the chief strategist at Destination Think. So what I do is um, I assist our clients by looking around the world and looking inside and outside of our industry for the latest developments, try to make sense of it, try to find the patterns, and then apply those patterns and turn them into models and then use those models to help our clients solve their problems. So, in a sense, that's kind of what I've been doing over the last couple of days. So, let's start with the things that I've learned. First of all, there's great entry music for every speaker. Uh, we've been doing that for a while. But then I learned about the Tarantino phenomenon, which means that now every time you hear Radar Love by Golden Earring, you're going to be thinking of me. So, I think that's a good thing. Secondly, I didn't know that you could surf uh, in the Arctic, in northern uh, Norway. That's something that I learned. And I learned way too much about Dutch culture, uh, including uh, Rokjesdag, uh, which is a very, very uh, Dutch phenomenon. I don't know how that would go over in Canada, to be honest with you. And I learned a new acronym, FOBO, Fear of Being Offline, which is true, is actually a big fear of mine, but I intend to go on vacation uh, this summer and actually turn off. Um, so, you know, I don't know what FOBO in an extreme form, what the symptoms are going to be, um, but we're going to find out. Okay, so now let's get into it. Uh, so let's start with I Amsterdam. Let's start with the first presentation of the conference uh, with shuttle uh, and the I Amsterdam sign. Um, which, when they put it up, they probably had no idea that this was going to be hailed as sort of the epiphany of modern tourism marketing uh, down the road, talked about at every destination around the world, and I can know because I hear all the stories from everywhere. The Amsterdam sign, we need something like that. But Shuttle shared something really, really valuable, and he kind of sort of mentioned it in passing. He shared some numbers. On an average day, 8,000 photographers will take a picture of the I Amsterdam sign. About half of them will actually share that picture on social um, through the research that they did. And they calculated that that would reach about 1.2 million people every single day. So you can see how insanely uh, quick social media scales. And this is just the I Amsterdam sign. Um, and this is, you know, just one thing in Amsterdam that people will share. So, what's happened as a result of social media is that the storytelling that a destination does, we're all storytellers, our advertising is basically just a story that we tell to a potential visitor. And the TV commercial is probably the best example. But even in print, there's the person, there's a beautiful landscape, it tells a story um, to the reader. But now in social, everybody is a storyteller. And all these stories are drowning out any type of message that you can put in front of the consumer. It's a drop in a bucket. And the impact is quite large. Because other people are now doing the marketing for you. In the old days, if you wanted to learn about a destination, you would go to your travel agent, or you would pick up a brochure, you would go to the library, maybe you would see something on TV, maybe you'd see some advertising, that was it. Now, that has completely changed. So, other people's stories are way more in volume than yours, but 
they're also way more credible, way more trustworthy, right? Um, Thomas shared some data around this, how important friends and family are, word of mouth. It's always been really important. This is now visible in social media. And even at the conference, um, the um, videos that Nancy was showing, you know, somebody had actually made a comment saying that the user-generated video was more impactful than the official video, even though that the official videos from Alberta are quite amazing. But it's true. So what is a destination brand then? And that's why it's great to have Jeff um, talk about storytelling and the impact on brands. And you know, one of his slides was, a brand is just a collection of stories. So it's individual, because we all hear different things about different places. If you picture any destination in your mind, let's say you know, Sydney, Australia, we will all know the Opera House, but we will all have a slightly different perspective on what would an experience in Sydney be like. And it's probably based on the stuff that we've heard, maybe in media, or maybe from friends, or maybe you know somebody there, or maybe you've been there. Of course, when you've been there, it's the ultimate experience, because then the experiences that you have on the ground will actually shape the perception that you have of that place. So it's unique to an individual. Everybody will have a different uh, brand perception of a place, and it's shaped by the stories that you hear, and those stories are now massively coming from social media, and not so much from the marketers. So let's think about destination storytelling then for a minute, because obviously this is where the action happens. This is where the stories are being made. It's not in the creative department of our advertising team, it is actually by the people on the ground with their own cameras. So a destination is really the, the stage, the stage where these stories take place. And I use Disneyland as an example of the perfect DMO. Because you know, in a sense, that's what they are. They're a destination. Now when Disney created Disneyland, he was a movie maker. So he applied everything he knew about move, uh, the movie business to building a theme park, which means that he storyboarded the whole park out. Everything in Disneyland and Disney World has a story. The park has a story. Every single section has a story. Main Street USA, um, few Tomorrowland, Frontierland, it's all documented. Every building within those sections have their own story. So if you're in charge of the interior design of a specific building, you read the story and you know how you need to design it, what kind of props you need to put in there, because you know the family that lives there, you know if they have children, you know the work that they do. And that's why when you go to Disneyland, it all kind of fits. It might be completely artificial, it might not be your thing, but it all fits down to the music. So a destination is the stage. So what's a visitor? A visitor in the story is really the lead character. This is what it's all about. The visitor goes through the destination um, as the main character of our um, story. So what do you do? Well, you, you experience different things. You go to different products, right? You, you arrive at the airport, you take a train or you take a taxi, you go to the hotel, you go to an attraction, you go to a restaurant. All these things are different scenes within the story and they happen to be mostly products. So every product that you visit is a different scene in your story. And the staff in all those businesses, they're really the supporting cast in this story. And Disney actually calls its staff cast members. They recognize this. And their staff is trained of the story that they tell. They know where they work, they have seen the story, they know how it all fits, and how they need to interact with the guest. Now, in a sense, even your residents are cast members in the story of uh, the visitor. And sometimes they can be really nice, and sometimes they can not so be nice. And I actually know destinations that are working with their residents to make sure that the visitors have a quality experience. I saw a great presentation by the um, Tour, uh, Minister of Tourism from the Bahamas about that. Because the Bahamas, that's their whole economy. And they're actively working with the local population to make sure that um, they know how to treat their guests. 
And then the experiences that people have at those different products, the interactions with the people, that's really the plot of the story. And that's different for everybody. You can go to the same products, but you can have different experiences. And ultimately, those experiences create the plot. That's the story, that your individual story that you create within that destination. And then what do you do? You tell the story in social media. So that's really important for destination marketing. The stuff that happens on the ground turns into stories that people share, which in turn turns into the perceptions that people have of your destination as a result. So that's the end game. The end game for us as marketers is to make sure what happens on the ground um, results in the right stories. So what do you need to do? You need to find or you need to create your destination story. And we've talked about focus and we've heard about focus. And focus in our world means niche. You need to find the niches that appeal in your destination. Now, there's a few examples, and I, I uh, took some from the conference in the US last year. Um, it was hosted in Nashville, and they gave a great presentation about their brand story. And Nashville is all about music, their music city. And they've, act they've actively worked with their operators and also um, with other stakeholders to make sure that the story in Nashville fits, and it starts at the airport. You land in the, uh, in the airport, there's guitars hanging from famous rock stars, just like in the Hard Rock Cafe, there's a band playing in the arrival hall, and then the whole story continues, and everybody in Nashville knows the story that they're telling, and they all participate. Rovaniemi, where the conference was last year, is another great example. Nashville is more organic. Rovaniemi, something is happening. Okay, we're good. Rovaniemi, they created their story because they're at the Arctic Circle in Finland. And they said, you know what? This is where Santa Claus lives. So they built a Santa Claus theme park. And that's where Santa lives. Now, the interesting thing when you go to Rovaniemi, it's a tiny little town, but it's all about Santa Claus. So I, I arrived, I took a taxi. Taxi driver, you know, typical taxi driver, they're usually either, you know, half grumpy. But he gave me a tour and he's like, you know, so we're driving by an industrial park. So there's a bunch of warehouses, you know, where probably automotive parts are stored or something. And he's like, oh yeah, that's where the elves pack all the toys into the packages. <laughs> I think it's the taxi driver. And then he drives me to Santa Claus Hotel, which is all about Santa. Now, after the conference, we went snowmobiling, which has absolutely nothing to do with Santa Claus, right? So, and this is northern Finland, where it's freezing cold, and this guy runs a snowmobiling experience. So you can imagine what he looks like. This rough guy comes out, he's got a cigarette hanging in his mouth. <laughs> hey, you go on the snowmobile. And I, I know, I, do, I, I butchered Finnish accents, I apologize to all the Finns in the room. <laughs> and... So then we, we stop on a break because he had to smoke every 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes we stop, we had to have all the smoke. So, I, I, so I, told, I asked him, I said, so, you know, what do you think of the whole Santa thing? Oh, Santa, yeah, my wife is an elf. <laughs> Everybody in Rovaniemi <laughs> plays along. And Frank talked, about, Frank talked about Star Trek. Frank talked about Vulcan. There's actually a town in Alberta called Vulcan. It's a tiny little farming community. They just happen to be called Vulcan, and they've run with Vulcan. Their visitor center is a spaceship. Every year they organize Galaxy Fest. Uh, their uh, city hall is called Galaxy Headquarters. And it's, it's quite phenomenal what they've done there. It's kind of like a mini Rovaniemi. So find your story and find your niche, just like Rovaniemi, Santa Claus, Nashville, music. But, and this is, was something really cool, the last couple of days, you need to be honest. You can't make this up, right? Because the experience on the ground will ultimately decide if the story that you've decided on is actually the story that people will have. And that's what I loved about Northern Norway. Yes, it rains. We don't care. You come here and you will experience the rain. Perfect. 
or Cleveland. Um, I was talking to uh, Corinne, and before they went to the rebranding, they were called Positively Cleveland. And that's what DMOs often do, right? They sort of, they name them what they want to be, not what they are. And so they just, they, they understood what they are, they went straight to the DNA of their city, and they said, that's who we are, take it or leave it, we're proud of it, and, you know, if you like it, you can come and you'll see it for yourself. Beautiful. They found their story. Emotional connections was another theme that popped up quite a bit, but emotional connections through storytelling in social media. Because often when, when a, a marketer, a destination marketer, when he hears, we need to make an emotional connection, they run straight to the TV commercial because of the impact of video. But that's now translated in online channels as well, obviously through video online. But you know what Colleen was sharing about her approach to community management and tied it back to the emotions that people have was absolutely brilliant. I'm definitely going to use that. That's going to be shared with all our community managers. That's something that we need to build into our uh, content plans because it is so true. And um, what I loved uh, about the presentation from Holland Marketing, that she, she doesn't care about being controversial. It's very Dutch. You know, she kind of likes it. All right, there's another fight on Facebook. Awesome, let's fuel it a little bit. That's very Dutch. You know, I have that trait too. <laughs> but an emotional connection is very important. But ultimately, you need to manage the destination experience. Like I said earlier, it's the end game. That's the end game, in my opinion. And that's why we're spending a lot of time thinking about this, thinking about the right processes to make this happen. You know, when you are Disney, it's easy because you own the whole park. You are everybody that's, that walks around in there that works for you, you know, every little restaurant, every little souvenir shop, every ride, you are full control of the whole experience. It's a little different than a DMO. We know that. You have your city and you're dealing with the taxi company and uh, public transportation, you know, and they uh, often don't really care. They have other problems than um, thinking about the DMO. But through relationships and through collaboration, there's a lot that you can do. And that's why the presentation from Thomas is really, really important because, you know, we, we saw this a few years ago, we saw the first signs of destinations becoming more actively involved, but using a process called service design to really map out what is the customer journey, what is the end-to-end -end customer journey, where are the pain points that we can mitigate, and sometimes the pain point is an operator, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to train them to make sure that they understand what story we're telling, that they understand how to deal with negative TripAdvisor reviews. We'll never forget the first time I spoke to operators, and you know, this is probably six, seven years ago. And it was like, well, how do I make sure that I can, how can I get rid of the uh, negative review on TripAdvisor? And we've come a long way already, but you know, when it comes to operators, consistently, everywhere in the world, when you ask an operator, what do you need from your DMO, they say, they need to tell me what I don't know. And they need to tell me where to start, and they have to at least give me access to some resources to help me become better at this. It's consistent, it's everywhere. Um, so you map the whole destination uh, journey, you mitigate the negativity, but you also build in those points, those shareable moments. The I am to them sign, so that you can say, okay, this is an opportunity, this is a marketing opportunity, this is a story that we want to tell, this is on brand, and this is what we're going to work on, this is what we're going to encourage. Okay, so that's the destination experience. Well, you don't have to solve this first before you do anything else, because that's going to take a while. But in the meantime, you need to identify the right storytellers for you. And if you know the story that you're telling, and you know the people that you're telling it to, then you can find out, okay, well, who are the ones that can best tell this story? 
because we've already learned that it's not necessarily us. I'm not saying stop marketing, stop community management, shut down your Facebook page, not at all. It's very important because you need to think about all the other storytellers as well. And we've seen some great examples. Um, we've seen Copenhagen uh, working with um, key uh, opinion leaders in China, which is sort of the uh, equivalent of uh, you know, a Western influencer, although they're completely different uh, culturally, but also the way um, uh, they behave and massive, massive audiences. Like two numbers that just, just blow your mind that some of these people have, including cats and dogs. Or um, Miguel from the Catalan Tourism Board, you know, he actively works with Barcelona FC, which is great because for a normal marketer, they're unattainable, right? Barcelona would never go to the cookie factory and say, oh yeah, sure, we'll help you out. But there's a pride associated with where you live, and that's what you need to tap into. That works for residents, but it also works for businesses. You'll be amazed how much you can get done, and you know, you're probably familiar with it, although I'm sure it's challenging at times too. The social media team from Tessa, you know, it's, it's an internal, uh, they're internal storytellers, but I did want to share it because I think it's just brilliant how she manages um, multiple languages on a small budget using expats who understand the culture, who understand the language, and who are passionate about Holland. I mean, they, they move there for a reason. They probably like it, otherwise they would probably leave. Um, and, you know, they have no problem uh, sharing that. And even... Um, the presentation that we saw about stuff Dutch people like. It, when, you're, when you're from another place and you move somewhere, you're very observant of the culture. I mean, I, I've lived in Canada for 18 years and I'm Dutch, and I know everything about Canadian culture, everything I like, everything I don't like. Um, but now I've been away so long, now when I come back to Holland, all of a sudden, you know, everything's wrong here too and everything is annoying. So, you know, but there's also a lot of good stuff. Stroopwafels, for example. Or Corinne from Cleveland, who with her buddy blogger um, campaign, which, was, which is brilliant, right? Because here you have a destination with an image, and what you're saying is, in your key market, you say, okay, I'm going to find the local influencer in these cities, and I'm not going to show them around. I'm just going to pair them up with my local influencer, and I'm just going to step back, and I'm just going to watch it happen. And the results um, were incredible. So identify your storytellers. Who are the best people to tell the story? But it includes residents. includes your businesses. It can include your staff. You know, the, 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 the possibilities are endless. When we were in the U.S. at the conference, San Francisco gave a presentation. Uh, San Francisco, uh, if you've been there, you know about the fog. You know, I went to San Francisco five times, and at the fifth time was the first time I saw the Golden Gate Bridge because the damn thing is always covered in fog. The fog has actually a Facebook page. And the, fa the f and it's, uh, what's his name again? Frank? Frank the Fog? And he took, all Carl the Fog, thank you. And he took over the San Francisco Tourism Board's Facebook page for a week, for example. Um, so when you've done that, now you need to motivate. This is something that uh, Nancy already shared. Motivate, encourage, curate, mitigate, and amplify. And I'm not going to elaborate too much. I'm actually tweeting right now where you can find more information. So you need to motivate people to share. Oh, yeah, we're sophisticated here. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I know it's the end of the day, and it's the last day. Um, so you need to motivate people to share, which is the I am to them sign, right? It's a motivation for sharing. Then you need to encourage them. And encouragement could be not that they need it, but they could put a sign that says, put this on Instagram. Or you can be a little more sophisticated, uh, like uh, Thomas's ski, ski pole example, uh, or his gloves. You know, put the, put the hashtag on, on, the, on gloves that you hand out, and people will all start uh, sharing in the, in the chair. Curation. A lot of talk about curation, especially Nancy, great presentation about it. You know, finding the right stuff that you can then either mitigate if it's bad or amplifies it good. So some good examples um, by Dimitris in Greece, 
who essentially discovered a problem and used locals to mitigate the problem. Um, and I've uh, mentioned Nancy. Uh, shuttle, good example about motivating people to share. Um, and Corrine, who also used her locals to share the real Cleveland and then amplify the best stuff. Now, in the US, we saw some examples of how people then take that one step further. They take the best curated stuff and actually create their destination guide if they still need to produce one. Uh, one destination has created a coffee table album with the best Instagram photos, which is amazing. One destination um, used Instagram photos in um, a YouTube video. Another destination actually put the, uh, a video like that on TV. Another one created billboards, of course, all with the right permissions. But you can see where it goes. The right content is created, you curate it, and then you just place it at the right places where it makes sense. So then you need to start thinking about how do I integrate all this? Because right now, when we walk in most DMOs, there's still a web team, a social team, email usually doesn't really exist, or something that's happening, but you know, the database is old and they send out an email every few years, you need to start thinking about how does it all connect? And then preferably tie it back to the path to purchase. You need to say, okay, what's the role of each channels in the path to purchase and how do we connect them? So how do I take a web visit and now how, do, how can I um, get that web visitor into either my email database or make it um, a fan of my Facebook page? or you know, whatever makes sense for you within you know, the, uh, the means that you have um, and the, the challenges that you have in the funnel. Do you have an awareness problem or do you have a conversion um, problem? So Thomas showed you know, one potential path um, and I think that Benjamin did a really, really good job um, explaining how they look at all their channels holistically. But the first step could be and uh, there was a presentation about it in the US as well, it could be, okay, how do you take social content and how do you use that for your email marketing, for example? Or how do you listen in social to create blog posts that answer all the questions that people are asking in social? And then how do you then put those blog posts in as content for your email marketing program? That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Now, back to Disney. As you can, I spend a lot of time <coughs> trying to figure out what Disney does because they're usually four steps ahead of us. Um, for example, when you talk about managing the destination experience, they've got a whole team for that. They call it Imagineering. They've got uh, a special title for it, and they've been doing it for years. So what they're doing now, they're managing that end-to-end -end experience. There were a few um, good articles recently. So you've got your online experience. You can go to the website and I've signed up for everything, so I'm bombarded with Disney stuff all the time. Um, so you know, I have a three and a half year old daughter, so I think it's gonna be soon enough that I'm gonna have to make a trip. Um, but as soon as I go to the website, now I'm followed around on the internet through remarketing, right? Um, and then I get an email, and guess what? The email is exactly the same stuff that I was looking at on the website. And then on the website, I actually ordered the DVD. They still offer a planning DVD, so it must, it must still work. I actually ordered it and watched it. It was, it was pretty funny. And then so when you actually booked, what they're doing now, this is something new, they're now creating a personalized um, um, piece that they send to you. So this is uh, Colin's party's incredible vacation. So your itinerary is in there, suggested planning, everything that you did on the website, they personalize all the materials. You can then are encouraged to download the app, which is the same thing. It has everything on it. You can get a wristband that you can use to skip the line. So before you even get there, you can say, okay, at 10 o'clock I want to be here, I want to be here, I want to be here. And that's how they manage you through the whole park. And of course, they know exactly where you are. They can see, um, they can map out their customer journey um, uh, to the minutia. And obviously that's really, really important to optimize the experiences. That's constantly what they're doing, right? So that's what I'm talking about. 
Okay, so the sense that I got sort of when I, when I read Twitter and, and, and speaking to people is, okay, and this is kind of new. Me and Rodney had this conversation. The previous conferences, there were a lot of eye-openers. People would be like, oh, man, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Oh, it, we really need to do something. People are almost past that now. It's like, yeah, we're, we're on board. We've seen enough examples of stuff that works. We believe in the theories that people are throwing out there. Now I have this one little challenge, which is the company that I work for. <laughs> and nothing against the people, because every single person, most persons, at pretty much every demo is super nice, you know, whether they work in the visitor center or they do traditional marketing or you know, they are in research. They all have the best intentions, and, but changing an organization is a struggle. And Katrina managed it. I applaud her for it. Um, but she pointed out the challenging. So what are we going to do? Now, we have worked with this for five years. So five years ago, we did our, bi our first big strategic project. And we were so proud we created this, this, this strategy, and it was going to be great, and the CEO loved it. And then nothing happened, right? Classic, because we, we ran into too many roadblocks and we really didn't consider enough. We were going to the CEO's word that he would make it happen. Now, five years later, we have a lot of experience. First of all, you need to, you need to use data-based decision-making because in tourism marketing, there's too much beauty-based decision-making. There's a video that's being produced. It's being shown to the stakeholders. It's all emotional, and they go, oh. Beautiful, beautiful, this is awesome. Nobody ever looks at the result. Or worse, the destination next door has a great video. Guess what the whole board is screaming? We need the same thing. Why don't we do what they're doing? Because it's beauty-based. It's based on a personal opinion about how things look. You need to go to a decision based on data. And you see it more and more. And there were some great examples. There were even more than this but you can see a total understanding of the consumer, a total understanding of their behavior. Now, if you combine that with the storytelling, our story, then you have the first ingredient that you need. Then you need to set focused objectives and KPIs that you can control. So, for example, Heidi from Surlandet, C has one KPI, and it's repeat visitation. That's what they're working on, because the thought behind it is, if people come back, that means they had a good time, they'll probably tell their friends. That's the only thing that we're going to drive towards with everybody in the organization and our whole industry. Destination British Columbia, they rolled out their new strategy just a little while ago. It's where we live, it's, and they use net promoter score as one of their key uh, KPIs. Now, net promoter score is something that I advocate to everyone. Here's the problem with measuring tourism revenue. If the economy goes down, the revenue goes down. Frank put it a little more dramatic on, in the panel. He had an Al-Qaeda reference. I won't go that far. But there's a lot of things that impact visitation to your destination that is completely outside of your control. So you can't be held accountable for it. You can do all the marketing right. You can create an insane amount of demand. But if your currency all of a sudden becomes really, really expensive, people won't come. So net promoter score, what is it? It's a really simple research tool. It asks one question to a visitor, and the question is, on a scale from 0 to 10, what's the likelihood that you would recommend this destination based on your experience? You take the number of promoters, which is um, 7, 8, 9, 10. You subtract the number of um, detractors, is the people that are probably going to badmouth you, 0 to 6. And then you have your net promoter score as a percentage. Growing your net promoter score probably means it's the best indicator that the experience on the ground is improving. Because if the experience on the ground is not good, they wouldn't say, yes, I'm going to recommend you. It's the only thing that you can really collectively with your industry uh, have any control over. And that's why it's really, really important to measure. 
And then there is the quest for the Holy Grail, including a lot of Star, Star Trek and, uh, and, um, and Vulcan. Um, and this is something that we're pretty excited about. Um, and we hope that you guys um, uh, are going to give us feedback and join the discussion to um, measure the impact of your marketing in a different way. So, you know, quick word about ad value equivalency. It's a great measure. There's nothing wrong with it. But what it does, it is about your um, efficiency of your marketing. Because what we did, we spent a thousand euros to get a PR story written. And if we would have purchased that as an ad, it would have cost us 10,000. That's not ROI, that's just we've been more, more efficient by using PR instead, and you can translate into social, nothing wrong with that. What we're trying to do here is to say, if I have an impact on a potential visitor, and I can actually prove that best I can with the maximum qualifier, if somebody on Facebook shares one of my photos, I can probably safely assume that that photo had an impact on that person. Otherwise, why would he share it? Sure, you can do like a meme and all this kind of stuff. There's, there's, there's tons of, um, there's tons of um, factors, but it's probably the best way to sort of look at, you know, what is the best proof that somebody, that what we did actually had an impact. And that's the only thing we're going to look at because to Frank's point, if you scale it, the numbers become quite scary. And then you translate that to actually what a, cons what a person would spend. Because somebody that comes from really far away probably spends more than somebody that is short haul. So instead of treating every guest or every, um, equal, we're going to actually look at it uh, by market or even by niche if the data is available. So you really, you're really measuring the potential that you're generating. We've done a lot of communication and we've done a lot of stuff to get people to share. And because we're looking at the maximum qualifier, the proof that this had an impact on a person, we can now actually calculate what the potential future revenue of that person could be. The conversion is kind of out of our, out of our hands to a large degree because there's too many factors that are outside of our control. That's the principle behind um, the new measure that we're working on. The next step is that we're going to run data from the six participating DMOs through the model to sort of see uh, what it looks like and see where we need to fine tune it. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Of course, you need to be strategic. You have your objectives, uh, you're working on things that you can actually measure and that you can actually influence, then you create your strategy and it was great to see Nancy, Tessa and others to sort of say, okay, well, this is, this is where it all starts and that's where I'm sticking with. My strategy is, you know, the way that I'm going to get to meet my objective, and it's not something that I'm going to change uh, every few days. But strategy is important, but Peter Drucker, the management guru from the last century, already said decades ago, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what we're dealing with at DMOs is a traditional culture, and the way you know that is because most DMOs are organized exactly the same way as they were 10, 15 years ago with like an online or a social department bolted on somewhere. So you need to change the culture, otherwise um, change is going to be slow and it's going to be painful. Now, what we actually started to do, I'll tell you a little secret, what we started to do is actually we started to change culture from within without even telling the client that we're doing it. That's actually the most effective <laughs> because then it just happens and, at the, and once in a while we poke each other and we say, hey. And the clients that we are actively working with, uh, they're being very, very strategic about it. How do we do it? By looking at everything that the destination does and that's sort of the slide on the right. So what we, what we do is we come in and we assess everything that the DMO does on a scale from one to five. This sort of ties, ties back to what Nancy said, our five levels of DMO social media sophistication. We've expanded that to everything a DMO does. And then we go through and we say, okay, from scale from, scale from one to five, where is um, the DMO at? And we have very specific criteria for it. Then we map that all out into um, a benchmark like that. 
And then we're sitting down with the right people at the DMO, and we say, okay, now we're going to move boxes. So where, there, where you are at two now, we want you to be a three next year or a four. And this one we're going to leave alone, but this one we're going to move forward. And every time that we take a step forward, we're changing the culture a little bit. Because every time we do it, we prove to someone in the organization or some people in the organization that there's a different way and it's not scary and it is effective and it's not, I'm not going to lose my job and it's, and it's still fun and I'm still relevant as a person. And slowly but surely, you move these boxes forward and what you see happening is that you see a transformation within the organization and it's, it's quite fun to, to uh, observe. So our strategy we create um, with the model that's, that's in the middle there, oh, uh, I should say behind me, and this is the way we, we're formulating our strategy. So, which is unique for every destination. Uh, we've created a series of blog posts that's ongoing still about it, but the bottom line is that what we're doing is we're connecting a target audience with specific experiences within a destination. That's the top and the bottom. Then what we do is we find the right stories that we should tell if these are the experiences, music in Nashville, and we want to tell it to people in New York, what are the right stories that we need to get to these people in order to motivate them? Then we're looking at what are the right storytellers to bring that, um, those stories to the people, the most credible, the most motivating, and what channels do we need to use in order to get there. That's the, that's the elevator version of it. So if you look at it top down, you start with experiences, experiences turn into stories through storytellers, they get the channels to the target audience. Now we're talking about marketing. If you go bottom up, you can say, okay, well, we have a really big city nearby and we really want to tap into them. So what are the kind of experiences that we need to work on? What's the st our destination story that we need to create in order to appeal to that audience? So it's uh, top-down destination marketing, bottom-up destination development. Some people would argue that it's all marketing and maybe destination marketing should be promotion <laughs> semantics, but um, that's uh, the principle uh, behind our strategy. And like I said, go to our blog and read about it. It's, um, it's probably interesting. And the last thing is that you need to lead. As a DMO, you're the only one in your destination that ties everything together. That's your role. Your operators are looking for it. Um, other stakeholders are looking for it. Um, you need to play that leadership role, but you need to collaborate. This is not a top-down thing. This is a collaboration. So be the first amongst equals within your destination to, make, to move people forward, to help, um, and to make everybody better. Rally them behind your destination story and get them moving. And you can do it um, like um, Helene has done. You know, she's not afraid, she's going to make mistakes, she's okay with it, she's, um, and she's going to stand by it. There's too many people being too afraid to fail, but what you need to do is fail forward, and that's part of changing the culture. By in, in, in social and in digital, you can make little mistakes without massive impact uh, and correct them, and when you got it right, you can scale it quite easily. And... But you also, you here specifically in this room, you're also the leaders, at least the thought leaders within your organization. Jesse from Tourism Australia said it in Australia. Um, you know, he has a social media team when, when he gave this presentation a couple of years ago. His social media team was two. Biggest Facebook page in the world, uh, biggest Instagram account in the world. It's just two people um, managing it. But he, from within, managed to... You know, Australia, Tourism Australia is a mammoth company, but he's already uh, moving things forward quite a bit. But being the evangelist and by being the one that's going to make it happen. Don't walk into your office and look around who's going to do this. It's probably going to be you who has to lead the charge. And that's exciting. It should be. So here's my summary, which I'm not going to go through because I hear there is alcohol over there. <laughs> So I want to thank you very much. Thank you for coming to the conference. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sticking around. And this is where you can find me. Thank you very much, William.